Hey, everybody. Welcome to the That Gets My Goat Marathon. Which marathon is it? It's the worst marathon ever, sir. Uh, that, that's official now. Guinness has called us up. <laughs> Officially confirmed. Worst ever. I wonder which marathon we're replacing. We're knocking out of the top spot. Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Anyhow, uh, a few weeks ago, we did an episode where we answered some questions. And then you had to go to work or, or something happened and we weren't able to answer all the questions. And I thought maybe we should take a few minutes to answer some of those questions from the listeners as part of our marathon. Is that cool? Sure. I suppose. All right. So I still have that qu- that the list. And unfortunately, there are no more Patrick Swayze related questions. Unless you'd like me to make one up. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, see if you can think of one. Um, when did you first discover how to pronounce Patrick Swayze's name? Uh, you have no idea. It was, it was when somebody said it on TV, I'm sure. You know what? I, it, funny about that Patrick Swayze, I finally realized what my favorite Patrick Swayze movie is. Uh, it's one that actually has Patrick Swayze in Not this time. <laughs> but Point Break. Oh, you like Point Break? That was a really good movie, and Patrick Swayze was the bad guy in it, which was interesting, too. He was the bad guy? Mm-hmm. Well, Keanu Reeves and Keanu... Patrick Swayze were the two guys, or was there a third guy? No, they were the two guys. He was the leader of the surf gang, surf bank robber gang, and uh, Keanu Reeves was the FBI guy who was trying to f- I track I FBI down. agent. That's right. Yeah, Johnny Utah, I think, was his name. Yikes. I believe James Cameron wrote that movie and Catherine Bigelow directed it. Yeah, that was a good film. I enjoyed it. Apparently, they're making a remake of it. So, everything that's old is new again. Hmm. That's too bad. Everything right is wrong again. Just like the long, long song. Something like that. I can't remember how that song goes. Did I tell you that the remake of RoboCop is PG-13? Yeah. You you used to rail against people for selling out. I think that's a really good example. Oh, I saw something on Facebook of a remake of RoboCop. I can't remember what what the deal was with it, though. Something humorous about stop making remakes. Damn you. I can't remember exactly (laughs) what the gist... I mean, that was the gist of it. Anyways, so we've gotten our Patrick Swayze question out of the way. What else you got? Okay, this question says, what grabs you from all the stories you've read for submissions to the Dune Steve? So we're talking like what kind of things is it? What are the things that make us like a story? When we see a story and we go, hmm, that's one I want. Time travel. Boom. Question over. Moving on. <laughs> I'm not sure what they mean because they say what grabs you from all the stories you've read. But it probably means just like what are you looking for in all the stories that you've read? What do they have in common, right? Yeah, I think I think what they're saying is what are the things that really speak to you? What do you think? Well, it's, you it think is of? so hard to quantify, to actually put in words. I, we've said it a bunch of times on the show that sometimes when I would read a submission, I would know just from the first page this is one that we're going to run on the show. I, I just, I, it spoke to me. It, it, I couldn't even put my finger on it. Today, I read a story. There was a submission where I was just like, oh, okay, unless this story goes to hell, this is one we're going to run on the show. And it didn't. It didn't go to hell. I really enjoyed it. And when it was done, I was just like, yeah, we will run this show. On, we will run this on the show. Then there are others that I, I want it to go in a certain direction. And I say, if it does, if it, if it goes where I, I'm hoping it will go, yes, we'll take it. But if it goes in a different direction, I don't think, I don't think I'll want it. And, and that's hard to explain, too. Because what are they, they're having to please me? Who made me the judge? But it's just a certain sensibility that I have, a certain thing that I respond to, whether it is... You know, if they go left, it will be really scary. Or if they go right, this will be fun. And maybe that's the big thing. It's just fun. There are there are, there are stories that are, are scary and still fun. There are stories that are about the end of the world and still fun. 
And we've run a couple of depressing ones. Yeah. But the stories think, about the end of the world and people just waiting for it to come and destroy them. The one about the guy in the water uh, who decides yeah. to just, you know, stay down there. These are not happy stories, but they still spoke to me in some way that I think I got fun out of those too. Yeah, it's it's hard to really quantify something like that. I think people who listen to the show could probably do the same thing. I mean, they can they can hear the story and know, okay, what do I like this story? And you you could even like say if I had a show, would I put this one on my show? And we do we talk about that sometimes with other people's shows. You know, we'll hear a story on somebody else's show and you'll be like, yeah, eh, it was all right, but we wouldn't have put that on our show. And, you know, it's just it isn't a story that spoke to us. And sometimes that's, you know, every person is completely different. So even you and I will have disagreements sometimes. And there have been stories that we've put on the show that weren't a story that I would I would have taken. But you liked it and wanted it. And I think we've had a few that are the opposite where you sure. were just like, Pfft. I could leave that story. Yeah, there was one where I was like, we are not taking the story. Please reject it. And you're like, nope, sorry, we already accepted it. So, yeah, it's it's kind of impossible to to say exactly what it is that grabs us. But, you know, there's some things that always will, you know, an interesting idea, something that's really novel and, and interesting where we're, oh, oh, wow, this is really cool. You know, something like that will often grab us and make us want to use that story and i think to make it even more likely to get on taking an interesting idea and then putting interesting characters that are you know well-rounded and and you care about into the story makes it all the more likely to get through and uh Maybe a lack of certain things too, you know, without we don't need the graphic violence or the violence on children or the certain things, you know, that we're just like, Dude, this is not, I mean, this is could have been a good story, but with this stuff, it's it's not going to make it. We're not going to put something like that out. This is just too sick and effed up for us. I mean, we've run some sick stories on our show before. But, you know, there's certain things that are just too much that we're just not going to do. And uh, so there's things that will ungrab us, I guess, which is not the question. So I don't know why I bothered to talk about it. They want to know what grabs us. It's generally someone's hand that grabs us. And sometimes it's That's those... my girlfriend you're talking about. <laughs> sometimes it's those little claw thingies where you, you have the handle and you squeeze it and then the claw actually pinches at the end of the stick. Okay. But usually it's the hand. I've found that there are two kinds of stories. There are stories that are entertainment and there are stories that are art. And I favor the entertainment kind by far. And every once in a while in another podcast we'll run one where I was like, okay, I can see that you know that that was that was trying to say something that was making a comment about or that was trying to paint a picture. But those tend not to be the ones that I respond to. Yeah, I'll have to agree with that. Sometimes I think some of those get us still, but it's it's much more rare. We're much more of the uh, plot-driven, entertainment-driven kind of stories. So here's the next question. Who is your favorite listener? Oh my goodness. Really? Yeah. Okay. Uh, should we just do it on three? We'll, we'll each say our own on three. Okay. <laughs> One, two, three. Reginald. Chris White. Okay. Next question. Okay. Um, did you know Alexander Graham Bell didn't invent the telephone? I I did not know that. Did you know that, Ed? I, I did not know that. I'm not I'm not sure uh, what they're getting at. Well, is it one of those things where someone else actually invented it and then he claimed it, Bell claimed it as his own, he or he marketed it, or he he made some kind of cosmetic change to it and then he gets all the credit, kind of like Columbus discovered America, and yet it's called, it's named after Amerigo Vespucci. You know what I mean? Maybe. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sure what the deal is with it. I wish I knew. I know that uh, there's always somebody disputing inventions of things out there. I know that there's 
Brazilians claim that somebody else uh, flew before the Wright brothers flew, and his name was, I don't remember what, but uh, there's always somebody out there. And from what I've heard, somebody else patented or tried to patent or something like that, another version of the telephone within like the same year or month or week or day, hour, that <laughs> Alexander Graham Bell patented it. So it's it seems sometimes like those things are just bound to happen kind of a thing you know what i mean like an invention is just everything else is built up to it and so it's just gonna come many people will get the same idea it's like you know all of a sudden there's two volcano movies in one summer <laughs> i was gonna say the same thing it's, it's just bound to happen it builds there's up two to diehards in the white house the same year right um so maybe it's one of those kind of things i'm not really sure what the uh, deal is behind this question well it's somebody who probably knows who the other person is or who the actual inventor was and wanted that person to get credit or wanted us to talk about it. Unfortunately, instead of saying, did you know that Alexander Graham Bell didn't invent the telephone, but so-and-so? I mean, that's how they should have phrased it, right? Yeah, maybe if they wanted us to go in that direction with the discussion instead of having the motorcycle guy drive by really loudly. I mean, we could have just wikipedia it and find it, found out what they were talking about, but... I didn't nah. do it. Yeah, well, we'll skip that. We just copied their questions and, you know, you get what you get. <laughs> yeah, and you know, everybody has had, anybody who's creative has had an idea that was their own and then they saw it done somewhere else or they saw it done to tremendous success somewhere else. And I remember there being a professor at our school who claimed that he had come up with the idea of William Shakespeare meeting a girl and falling in love and, and that inspired his his plays, you know, especially uh, Romeo and Juliet. That was his idea and at the time I was just like oh geez, well that's not fair is that what Hollywood's like? kind of thing and uh, our film professor would say no, look, everybody cl would claim that somebody ripped off something else. Uh, Titanic had been a big deal and everybody said, you know James Cameron stole this and when Avatar came out everybody said I wrote Avatar, or I created that, or, you know, and you'll say, you know, Hollywood is not in the business of stealing people's ideas. They can pay a pittance for your idea and, you know, then do whatever they want for it. They, I mean, why would they just steal something when they know there's going to be a, a lawsuit if they actually stole something, you know? He just said that inspiration strikes and you may have an idea and never write it, and somebody else did, or, or 10 people in this room may have the same idea, but until you've written it, they are the same idea. When you write it down, they'll all go in different directions and have yeah. different tones. And I think we've proven that with the Broken Mirror story, where we give people an idea to start with, and then it all goes in a different direction. And uh, definitely reading stuff from the slush pile, I've found that that is the case. We'll get various stories that are similar you know, they got a similar idea, but, you know, they're different. They're written by different people, and therefore they're different. It's just the way it has to be. You know, I've, I've, I think I may have even mentioned that on here one time when I was walking down the, the hallway or whatever you would call it, the concourse. I don't know. I was in the mall, and I was walking along, and I came across a poster in the middle of the mall, and it was for the movie called Clock Stoppers. Okay. And I, I went, oh, crap. That was an idea that I had had years before, and I'm pretty sure I told you about it when we were in film school. I was like, oh, this would be such a cool idea, and this would make a great movie. And especially now, because, you know, that was right when they started coming out with the whole bullet thing. Time. Yeah, the bullet time thing where they had the cameras that would shoot all around the person, and they'd do the 3D model of them, and they'd zoom around them. So you could freeze somebody and then have somebody walk around them and look at them, and you could freeze the water in the air and... All that kind of crap, and and they started doing that on like every commercial. Somebody would have like a remote control or something, and they would freeze frame everything, and they would go walk through it, and oh look at this, and I just thought, oh that would be perfect for that idea. I, I totally need to write that script, and I thought about it, brainstormed it a little, never wrote it, and then one day I was walking in the mall and I saw the poster, and I went, oh crap, I missed my chance, because <laughs> now here is that movie. Of course, nobody remembers that movie, so I could do it again. Did you see Clockstoppers? I did actually, yeah. I, I think we've had this conversation before. I'm sure we on have, here, and I because want to I say remember on the air. saying Jonathan Frakes directed that, and 
You're like, yeah, okay. <laughs> Another reason to hate him. <laughs> but yeah, I, you know, that's the same kind of a thing. I had that idea. I didn't do it. They didn't steal it from me. Uh, that much I know, unless they, you know, NSA monitoring my telephone calls that I had with you in college, which I'm sure did not happen because that person <clears throat> would have hung themselves long ago. <laughs> the funny thing is, in those days, we talked in person. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think we can talk about that in a We could do a whole episode about ideas that we had had that somebody else did. And you're just like, oh, no. And yeah, there was an idea that you had that I wanted to go a different direction with. And I'm sure had you written yours and I had written mine, they wouldn't have borne much resemblance to each other. Yeah, that's an interesting thing. Um, and yeah, that's just the way it is. So Alexander Graham Bell may have, and may, I'm, I'm sure he invented the telephone, and somebody else did too, and th three people also did. I don't know. Or maybe that has nothing to do with this question, and they're just being, you know, a-holes, and they're messing with <laughs> us. I don't know. That would be know. awesome. We've <laughs> talked for ten minutes about something where there's just like, the correct answer was no. <laughs> Here's the next question. This is a uh, an in-depth one. This one we can answer actually quickly. Who wrote the story in the last episode of Doonstief that you guys have claimed to have already recorded? Mm. So who wrote it, Rish? We didn't have a story in the last episode. <laughs> um, That's right. It was just a, hey, folks, we're not pod fading. We're going away. We did record that episode. I would say it was like January of 2012. We recorded that episode, and do you have a copy of it? I don't think so, no. You don't? Oh. Yeah, you edited it, and you claimed to have put it in the, the uh, Dropbox, and I've never seen it. Okay, well, I'll have to put it in the Dropbox again. Uh, in fact, here's a clip from it. Teenage Dream. Well, this song is uh, it's, it's a tribute to teenage decadence, teenage indiscretion. And you know what? I listened to it, and there's this line in the song that the first time I heard it, for some reason, it was just like a slap. And the line is, you and I will be young forever. And I don't know if that whole song is meant to be ironic or if it really is that youthfully naive. But being here with you at the end of all things, you're not young forever. Nobody is young forever, and it goes by so fast, and you look back. But you can remember that sensation, that, that almost certainty of you and I uh -huh. will be young forever. The future is so, so far away, and there's infinite possibilities, and, and I will always be happy, and will be young forever. I'm not old now, but I can see it mm -hmm. coming. Down. I can feel it in my back right now at 1.30 in the morning. It's on the way, and every time... I'm sitting on this crappy hard chair. <laughs> they, they are crappy, but someday you and I will look back at sitting in these uncomfortable chairs, and we will wistfully look back and say, gosh, those were good times. And Basically, it was just you and me sitting down and me saying, something has happened and we're not doing the show anymore. Maybe we're not friends anymore. Maybe one of us has died. Maybe one got a job and they moved away or something like that. But we didn't want to pod fade, like you said. We wanted to have a final episode. And so we're doing it long in advance. But we didn't do a story. It was just us talking for about an hour about the highs and lows of the show and me being pissed off at Abby Hilton. And <laughs> we talked about what is our what has been your favorite episode that we ran and... And, Which uh, would be funny because we recorded it years ago now, and that now makes it so we don't include a large portion of episodes. I guess not a large portion because our pro our productivity keeps slowing and slowing the further we go along. But uh, but yeah, we may we may have to do a second final episode <laughs> here pretty soon, unless we hurry up and you know get this thing over with. And then it would still be cool. So basically, yeah, at the end of the episode, we just say our goodbyes. And I said, you know, hey, it's been a good ride. And we thanked people. And that, then we signed off. I, I can't even remember what inspired that. 
I think it was that there was that other podcast that I really liked listening to. And in their forums, they said, we are no longer friends and we're not, we don't talk anymore. So there will be no more episodes. We didn't realize it at the time, but you know, so-and-so was our last episode. Sorry guys, you know, and, and that really bothered me. And so I was just like, oh, well, we've got to prevent that from happening with us. Yeah, we we've don't got want to, to just... do clock stoppers to prevent the time from... There you go. Yeah, we don't want to just disappear. So we've got that set aside that we can just say, hey, here it is, the end. So that's Rish's favorite words in, in when he writes a story is the end. So we want to make sure we can include that on our podcast as well. They are the most beautiful words, man. If you're a creative person... The sensation of reaching the end is just like, wow, I have accomplished something. I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure how to c- compare it to other things, but I, you know, if you're a, a painter or if you're a, if you work in construction or something like that, you know, th- maybe it's just having a job and getting the paycheck. And it's like, wow, okay, I did it. I, I accomplished that, and now I've been paid. I, I don't know. Cool. Okay, so our next question. Who is your most attractive listener? Are you kidding? There's really that there? Yep. You ready? One, two, three, and we'll go, okay? One, two, three. Jillian Richards. <laughs> All right. See, that's a strange question. We, we don't <laughs> run into listeners very often. In fact, I mean, we've only met a handful, mostly at the New Media Expo. Um, we met Scott Pig. Um but that's it, right? Yeah, pretty much. I don't know that we've met any others. Uh, it's, I guess we've seen pictures of some on, uh, oh, on Facebook, Facebook yeah. and stuff. So maybe we can, uh, maybe maybe we'll get one of those hot or not things like on social network, and we'll just do a, do a whole game. Is this person better than this barnyard animal? Was that wasn't that what they were going to do? <laughs> you saw social network, obviously, or you wouldn't have mentioned it. But I that was the example that I would give to everybody about how well made that movie was that he's typing all this code and it was riveting to watch him program somehow fincher had directed this movie in a way where it was just like this should be the most boring thing imaginable and yet i'm oh spellbound by him going and watching things appear and watching people look at their monitors and go oh that was neat cool that movie should not have been nearly as good as it was. But again, if you care hard uh, enough or you work hard enough, you can make a great movie out of anything. Okay, here's our next question. Um, and I, I suppose this one pretty much has to go to you because it really doesn't apply to me. Who is the most famousest person you have ever met? Oh, you've never met a famousest person? I wonder what the the qualifications of meeting somebody is do you have to actually speak with them do you have to shake you have their to hand? swap bodily fluids oh well then in that case i've probably met some famous <laughs> people more than you know no because no, uh, like seeing somebody speak for example does that count or does that not count like going to comic-con or whatever and you see joss whedon speak have you now met him or is that not enough you have to shake his hand you have to get his autograph on your poster and have him say, thank you, sir, for having my daughter sign your poster. Because that makes me... <laughs> that saves I, me a lot of grief. I hate that you... That was one of my favorite stories. You made that sound creepy and dark. <laughs> I'm just... I what, what counts is meeting somebody. I once saw George W. Bush speak at a campaign rally or whatever in the year 2000 before he was the president... And I think of anybody that I've ever actually seen in person, that he would that would be the most famous. Oh, yeah. Because the president of the United States is usually a pretty famous person. Everyone around the world knows him. But I, I haven't met him. I haven't shook his hand or talked to him or spoke to him or come anywhere near him without being tackled to the ground and beaten by a uh, national security agency. Isn't that, the, isn't that the one that protects the Secret president? Service. Ah, uh, Secret Service. There we go. Thank you. Secret Service agents. That's the most famous person I've actually seen. But that doesn't really count. Okay, well, let's narrow it to Matt. Because I haven't let's... met anybody. If it gets down to Matt, then <laughs> nobody. You met Kristen Dunst. I did, yeah, sort of. Although you were the one that actually spoke to her. I was just kind of near her. And I said, ah, Jumanji. <laughs> <laughs> I 
That's so awesome. She's like, hey, how are you doing? Hey, Jumanji. <laughs> Little women. Uh, That's pretty much the extent of what I said. But yeah, I was next to you when you spoke to her, so maybe that counts. Oh, shoot. So you, I, you say somebody, and I'll think of if there's anybody else that I met that's famous. Well, see, it's hard to narrow it down. What, what, who is the most famous person I've met? And You once uh, hugged Paris Hilton when you were in a Lucky the Leprechaun costume. <laughs> she's pretty darn famous. She's super famous, but God, let's cut that part out because, jeez. <laughs> I don't know that I hugged her. <laughs> I wondered, you know, how I... I tested positive the next time I went in. You know, it's 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 hard to say, you know, where somebody is on the barometer of fame. Or, it, um, but it goes up and down, too. Like we're talking Paris Hilton. She's really famous, but she's gone away. Now it's Kim Kardashian that would be Paris Hilton, you know. Yeah. And I'm sure she'll go away and be replaced by somebody else. It's weird because Paris Hilton was absolutely worthless. And I probably told the story on the air of meeting her. But she has accomplished way more than Kim Kardashian. So, I mean, even though our barometer was down here at the absolute lowest point, you can always find a shovel. <laughs> Jeez, I, I, it's hard to say. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to answer it exactly because I, I, I can't think of who we would put. But the first time I met Stan Lee, that to me was just like a milestone. It's like, what do I say to this guy? who basically, you know, forged my childhood or, or, or in many ways, you know, the things that I love and the things that I believe in, he was instrumental in. And uh, he's an old man. He's in his 90s. So he's not going to be around forever. But the second he goes, then people, it's kind of like Michael Jackson, how he had faded from popularity. He'd become a punchline. He'd become a, oh, geez. The That's second creepy. he died... Everybody forgot about all of that crap, and he was the king of pop again. And you hear Michael Jackson songs on the radio all the time now. And the, yeah, I never heard Michael Jackson on the radio in the five years leading up to his death, um, because he was a, he was he had been tainted. Yeah, he was a punchline or whatever. And I'm not saying that Stan has been tainted, but it's just like as long as he's alive, people can't take a step back and say, "Look at all this guy has done." And, but once he's gone, everybody's going to say, oh, my gosh, really? He did that, too? And nobody appreciated him until he was 90? He didn't become a millionaire until he was 90? Are you guys kidding me? You know, that kind of stuff. So I'm going to say Stan Lee. I mean, you may know somebody off the top of your head that I've met that is more famous. Oh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. I met Arnold Schwarzenegger. I shook his hand. He he's said, certainly. I think I remember your blog post about it. He said, certainly, yes, because I asked him if I could shake his hand, and his hand just enveloped mine. It was so big. It was like a fudge and catcher's mitt, and, you know, Schwarzenegger uh, has faded as well, but for a long time, he was a giant, giant star, and... and, and He's a giant, and, you know, he was a giant star, and he was beyond that governor of California for a while, and, you know, those... Uh, California and New York or something like that are the U.S. to a lot of people, you know what I mean? It's one of those places that everyone has to visit or something like that. You know, my wife, who grew up in Canada, was just like, oh, we're going to, we're going to see the Hollywood sign, and we're going to, oh, this would be so neat to go to California. And then she lived there for several years. She's like, oh, get me the hell out of California. Oh, my gosh. Um, <laughs> but, but, yeah, being the governor of California is a pretty big deal. Uh, it's not being the president of the United States, so pff, you suck. Oh, no, wait, you shook his hand, so you win. I just saw him from afar. Oh, well. Well, I don't know. Do you want to change your answer? I, I haven't met very many famous people, uh, unfortunately. And when I'm in the presence of a famous person, I'm one of those people that's like, oh, my gosh, that's that, fa that person. Oh, my gosh, he's right over there. Can you believe it? And I, I just stay there and just go, oh, my gosh, look, he's right. Oh, there, oh he's, he's, he's going out the door. Oh, there he's gone. Oh, wow, that was neat. And then, yeah, I tell people, oh, I was at this thing, and I saw him across the room, and I shat myself, and it was so rad. But, yeah, I don't, I'm not the person that goes up and talks to him. I, I've never had the nads to do that, I guess. I remember being kind of surprised that day when we were on set with Kirsten Dunst, and you did that. And I was just like, dude, this guy's crazy, man. He's lucky he didn't get beat down by the 
security guards or the assistant director, whoever the heck protects the stars from the hoi polloi. She was just a person back then. Yeah, she I was. I think it was Bring It On that made her a star, right? Or, I mean, and then Spider-Man came along yeah. and, and suddenly, you know, everybody loved her briefly. <laughs> But yeah, I don't know. Uh, at the time, yeah, Jumanji was all she was known for. She was still a kid, too. I mean, she, she had a long ways to go. I, I was not an, an extra in Hollywood for years like you were. So you were within striking distance of many of these people. So you could sneak up and shake their hand before they could ward you off. I've only shaken a couple of hands. Yeah. I'm not a good handshaker. You know, and you never know how much interaction you're going to have. Like when I worked on the West Wing, Martin Ching just hang, hung out with the rest of us. You know, we all ate from the same table. And, uh, from but, the same trough? From this trough, yes. <laughs> but when I worked on the X-Files at the exact same time, you know, like Gillian Anderson went to her trailer, you know, to eat or whatever. She wasn't going to eat with us. You know, we were scum. And, and it's just, you know, it depends on the person. It depends on the set and also how many extras there are. Mm-hmm. I do miss that. I, I I've done a couple of extra gigs this year, and it's I think it's a blast. But uh, everything is different too. There are terrible ones too. The one that you went on, I remember, or maybe you didn't suffer like Ian and I did. But we were in these itchy wool uniforms. Yeah, see, I didn't have the so wool hot. uniform. I had a sweet daddy argyle sweater vest instead, which totally made me stand out when the show actually hit air. I was able to pick myself out from. Well, it wasn't a crowd. I was actually like. Front and center, I walked right in front of the camera mm-hmm. when I came in and sat down, so it was easy to see myself I anyways. I saw you, I didn't see me. Yeah, but yeah, you guys it. didn't show up at all. You guys were just like dark, shrouded figures. But I wasn't there the day that they were doing the dance scene, and they had like the room all smoked up and all that unpleasant stuff, so I didn't have to deal with that. So yeah, there is there is things that can make it lame, but getting a chance to see a celebrity in real life has got to be cool. I mean, you've told me about how you were on set with Beyonce... And um, yeah, so how Jeff, gorgeous she really is in real life. And my stuff. buddy Jeff does not find her attractive. And I was like, dude, I worked on Dreamgirls for three days and I stared at her. And yeah, she is so insanely good looking. And he's like, eh. but, you know, everybody has their their measuring stick. Mm-hmm. But I was just like, wow, that chick is good looking. And, you know, I don't know. It's, it, it's sort of glamorous to be an extra. And it's sort of not. Right. Because it depends on the, the, the situation you're in. But to watch her lip sync for, you know, six hours straight or whatever. I mean, they, they were in all these awesome outfits and stuff and they were super made up. And I mean, maybe she doesn't need makeup. Maybe she is that good looking. But that sort of thing is fun to me when there, there are chicks that I've either lusted after or I've always admired. And to actually get to meet them and some of them turn out to not be that hot and other so i'm like wow dreams do come true you know so. yeah you're like wow you're actually better looking in person than you are on tv that's that's yeah, that's right i think i said that to joss whedon <laughs> yeah that's uh that's interesting yeah i haven't met a lot of famous people um and i think that's probably the case with most people you only get a chance here and there to meet somebody that's a, that's really famous uh unless yeah you you or in the right profession. An extra is one of those, I suppose, being an actual uh, an a, a speaking part actor, you would get a better chance to meet them and be actually with them and perform a scene with them, which might be uh, awesome. But uh, you get what you get. And don't throw a fit. Wait, what? Is that a song lyric? No, it's just one of those things that you say to little bastard kids that whine all the time. You get what you get and you don't... You get what you get and don't throw a fit. Okay. I'll make a note of that. I think we've run out of time for today's marathon episode. Yeah. We've got uh, several more questions still, so I could suppose we could still do one more of these uh, question and answer episodes. Okay. Well, That's cool. Well, then we will leave you for one more day. One more day. One more oh. I was going to start singing Phil Collins, One More Night, which doesn't really work since you said One More Day. So we'll leave it at that. See you later, folks. Thanks for listening to the worst marathon ever. And it was. It really was. That Gets My Goat is produced under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. 
but it really shouldn't be.